Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the autumn 2022 season of the Virtual Museum Lecture Series presented by the St. Catharines Museum and Welland Canal Center. Our community is filled with diverse stories, and we recognize that our story begins with the Indigenous peoples of this land. We acknowledge that we are broadcasting this lecture on lands that have been inhabited by Indigenous peoples for millennia, and we would like to honor the centuries of Indigenous peoples who walked on Turtle Island before us. Good evening, everyone. My name is Adrian Petrie, Visitor Services Coordinator here at the St. Catharines Museum and Well Canal Center. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone joining us from uh, your screens this evening, whether you are tuning in live or after the fact. A special welcome to any audience members out there who are new to the series. Welcome and thank you for joining us. We hope these lectures provide a bit of historical joy and spark imagination and exploration of our city's rich history. There are so many ways to join in on the historical fun and get your local history fix. You can view all the past lectures on our YouTube uh, channel playlist, and you can listen to the lecture audio on our podcast, VLMLS via podcast, which you can find anywhere you get your podcasts under STC Museum Podcasts. As always, please feel free to make use of the chat box to ask questions or send comments. We'll moderate them during and at the end of the presentation. Uh, there is a slight delay in the broadcast, so if we miss your question, we'll get right to it at the end of the presentation. We so appreciate you joining the lecture series and we would equally appreciate a donation in support of our programming. Your donations help us to continue to provide the high quality and enjoyable programming that you have come to expect from us. We really appreciate any donation you're able to make. Give us a call at 905-984-8880 or visit the donation portal on our active STC page to make a donation. Your donation makes a difference. It really does. Thank you. Before I hand it over to Kathleen, I would like to share our upcoming lectures for the season. There's only two left after today. On November 29th, special guest, local historian, and the chair of the city's heritage committee, Brian Nari will return to the series to give a talk about early settlement in St. Catharines. As uh, long-term, long-time audience members will know, uh, Brian loves a good title and offers this as the title to his lecture, Ponderous Frouse, Mineers, and Jaded Farmhouses, Horses, Jaded Farm Horses, or <laughs> Early St. Catharines Before the First Well and Canal. I was so proud of myself for saying Mineers correctly that I messed up and said horses instead of horses. <laughs> uh, anyway, <laughs> and finally, we're also happy <laughs> to welcome back uh, Dr. Kimberly Monk on December 13th to provide a bit of an update on her work at the Shikluna Shipyard Dig. After two years away from the site, Dr. Monk was back on the dig this past summer, and we're looking forward to welcoming her back to hear more about this fascinating history. As you might remember, she wrapped up the very first series in the spring of 2020 with a lecture about her work at the shipyard. So we're looking, to, looking forward to hearing more. And now I'm happy to welcome someone who needs no introduction, our very own curator and supervisor of historical services, Kathleen Powell. Take it away. Thanks so much, Adrian. <laughs> You're welcome. Mine ears. <laughs> <laughs> but farm horses, not houses. Okay, <laughs> I'll be in the background. <laughs> Goodbye. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Oh, uh, actually, I can't share my screen until you stop sharing, Adrian. There we go. Perfect. Okay. So uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome, uh, and thanks for joining me for my presentation uh, this evening to talk about public works uh, in St. Catharines uh, during the interwar uh, period. Uh, I was actually really inspired uh, to do this presentation by some interesting, what I thought were interesting photos of workers paving roads and laying sewer in St. Catharines in 1919. Uh, one of the photos was uh, the photo that uh, was kind of the um, the sneak peek advertisement that you saw for this presentation of the uh, the guys laying uh, all kind of standing around the paving machine uh, in that neighborhood. 
uh, which was Court Street. Uh, you'll see uh, those both of those pictures later on in the presentation, but that's kind of what inspired me um, in my research also about the 1917 election campaign, which you may or may not have seen that presentation. Uh, I was also became really fascinated by the role that the municipality plays in the lives of people in the city uh, and how that might have changed over the years. Uh, so when I was given what option I would use uh, as my topic for my final lecture, which seemed like a long time ago, maybe like a year ago, we chose these topics. Uh, this was the topic I chose to explore. I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed uh, researching and learning more about uh, about this topic. Uh, for the um, for this presentation, um, oh, let me see. Oh, there we go. Uh, for this presentation, I am defining public works as uh, any work that was done by municipal government in support of the public interest. So uh, public works isn't necessarily just what you might uh, define it as uh, roads, pa paving roads, sewers, uh, kind of infrastructure work. To me, I've defined it for this presentation as anything the municipality was involved with that uh, impacted the community. Um, the main sources that I engaged for as part of this work were city council minutes from 1918, 1919, 1920, and 21, uh, as well as from 1929 and 1930. I had thought I would have time to do research through all the city council minutes from the entirety of the interwar period, but uh, it's a massive amount of information to go through and there just wasn't enough time to do that uh, for this presentation. So I stuck to uh, the immediate uh, uh, post-World War I years and then uh, one decade later, essentially. Um, so the city council minutes from just 1918, 19, sorry, 1918, 1920, and 21 uh, were found in three bankers boxes, which you can see the picture of here. They're actually stacked up in my office right now uh, out of an entire room full of boxes, exactly the same located in the basement at city hall. Uh, and I was, uh, really uh, happy to be given access to this resource um, and I want to thank Kevin in the clerk's office for assisting me with uh, with having access to this source and uh, for being super helpful as I uh, navigated the uh, um, the process to use the uh, this uh, this source um, so all of the council minutes are actually found. Each council meeting is in an individual envelope, as you can see here in this picture, and they're all folded up tiny, and they've been folded like that for 100 years, roughly, <laughs> some of them. Uh, and uh, so I was uh, required to pull them out, unfold them, try to find a way to hold them open without ripping anything and uh, uh, and to uh, to get the information out. So it was an interesting process. Uh, and that was for the early city council um, minutes. And then I was lucky enough that for the 1929 and the 1930 council minutes, at some point the city had decided to bind all these minutes together in one volume for the entire year, which was great. Thank you anonymous city person who decided to do that sometime in the past. Um, so sadly, on these uh, bound minutes didn't include any of the additional correspondence that would have been sent, sent to council at the time, but uh, it included all the reports uh, and the standing committees of council, such as uh, the works committee, parks and cemeteries, fire and lighting and market and any special committees uh, that were um, Hold together by council at the time. Uh, and depending on the time of the year and the time of year, there was a variation in the name of some of the standing committees that existed at the time. Uh, so as I said, I'm just focusing on uh, those small blocks of years because as you can see, it's a lot of uh, information to get to. Uh, but before we delve into the hot topics of discussion for city council, let's take a look at Canada and St. Catharines the Canada and the St. Catharines that a visitor would have encountered at the end of the First World War. What were the impacts of the Great War on Canada overall? Uh, the country was changing rapidly. During this period, the country was moving rapidly from a rural to an urban population. By 1921, 468 urban places in the country accommodated 
45% of the population. So almost half of the population lived in under 500 urban uh, areas. And this urban growth was primarily focused on the very largest urban centers in central Canada, uh, which were really beginning to attract manufacturing and commerce at the expense of smaller urban places um, that stagnated because of their inability to develop a distinctive industrial base. St. Catharines was a community that was able to take advantage of uh, cheap, take advantage of advantages <laughs> such as cheap and abundant water supply, easy access to electrical power sources, and close proximity to markets in Southern Ontario and the United States uh, in order to increase its manufacturing base. And with this industrial growth came population growth and increased prosperity across sectors. I should have already uh, moved past this, <laughs> this particular uh, slide, but this is, uh, so this slide up here is the downtown of St. Catharines. It just, I should mention now that uh, because this topic may not seem incredibly riveting to most people, uh, that I've decided to make it a bit of a, uh, a illustrated lecture uh, with some really great pictures from the museum's collection to supplement the uh, the topic itself. And um, so where there's a place to add a photo that relates to what I'm saying, uh, I've added it here. So as you can see, St. Catharines downtown, it's pretty growing concern. Uh, it's become very urban. Uh, there's a lot of traffic and a lot of business happening. Uh, St. Catharines is, as you all know, close to a lot of water and a lot of water uh, power um, to be used for many different um, uses. Uh, and this is just a really great picture of um, the road that uh, crosses Martindale Creek in 1907 and what it looked like. So you can see as you move out of the inner part of the city, um, the more rural parts of St. Catharines um, are there. This photo here is the um, Norris uh, Mill that was located above Lock 8. Uh, and later became the Packard Electric Company in this picture circa 1910. And again, you can see water power, industry, uh, transportation, all kind of coming together to make St. Catharines a really appealing place for businesses to, uh, to grow. <laughs> and this picture, uh, while not necessarily the, uh, the period right at the end of the First World War, uh, this is the provincial paper mill, which is located on Front Street in Thorold. It shows you a really great example of how water power is being used, uh, not only in the transportation of goods and uh, services along the Welland Canal, but also uh, to generate power uh, for those industry as well. Plus, you can see there's a um, transportation, interurban transportation in this photo with uh, roads and um, streetway array. Uh, so it really kind of captures a lot of uh, what I'm talking about as far as what made St. Catharines and Niagara an appealing place for people to live. By the first, uh, by the post First World War period, nearly every urban center was also served by at least one passenger train a day, which connected to transcontinental railways uh, that linked the country from coast to coast. And as you know, St. Catharines and Niagara were no different. I know Meriton wasn't technically part of St. Catharines uh, at that time, uh, but I thought a great picture of the Meriton railway station here would be, uh, would be appropriate. Uh, and this picture was taken in 1900 of the Grand Trunk Station in Meriton. Regional networks of rail systems uh, connected cities, towns, and villages and made ease of travel for work and leisure a reality. Within the Niagara region, the NSNT made inter-regional travel possible with connections to trains and passenger vessels to places far and wide. Uh, this is a picture from um, sometime between 1910 and 1920 of the NST somewhere between Meriton and Thorold. <laughs> I know that's not super specific, but a uh, great picture of uh, the conductor and uh, um, some of the passengers on this train. While not as quick to grow as the rail system, the post-war period also saw the growth and proliferation of the cross-country long-distance phone network 
Provinces and territories prior to this were managing their own jurisdictions and the technical and economic issues of transmitting signals over great and often sparsely populated distance worked against effective interregional communication in Canada. Through most of the early interwar period, long distance calls were actually switched through American centers such as Chicago and Boston using the American Telephone and Telegraph Company phone lines. By 1932, strong resolve by Canadian companies to establish a transcontinental system eventually made possible the completion of an all Canadian trunk line, the Trans Canada Telephone System, in 1932. Uh, this is a great picture. I'm sorry that I had to use a photo out of a book, um, but it's the uh, telephone uh, um, gang of men who were laying phone lines locally in 1925. Um, I love this picture because it's very clearly St. Catharines, even though they've spelled the, the name of the city different from what we currently do today. A third part of the important growth that, that helped to propel Canada into the modern age was the growth and development of the hydroelectric power transmission system. In Canada overall, Niagara Falls and Shawinigan Falls were really the biggest ones to be exploited due to their enormous potential to generate power. But eventually smaller sources of water power were also important regional generators of hydroelectric power, such as locally, we know the DeCu power generating station first built in 1898 and expanded over the years. Uh, this is, we think it's a picture of that. Uh, if it isn't a picture of that station, it's a picture, it's, it's kind of a, who knows whether it's this picture or that picture. Uh, it could be the power station in Niagara Falls. It does actually look quite a bit like that as well. Uh, either way, it's a power station. Uh, the increasing availability of electric power, much of it at a relatively low cost, was critical uh, to the industrial development of this region and served to reinforce previous growth that had stagnated during the war years. Prior to the First World War, the government of Ontario had actually created the Hydroelectric Power Company or sorry, Hydroelectric Power Commission of Ontario, which ensured that there was a wide distribution of Niagara electricity to industries in Southern Ontario. By 1929, when post-war industry growth was high, HEPCO had gained control of most production and distribution of electric power in the province. They kept rates low and encouraged local production and sale of a of a variety of appliances, which enabled the commission to increase not only the industrial consumption of electricity, but also domestic consumption. You know, there's always a, a kind of a pushback from people to change their ways and being able to provide electric stoves, electric lights, all kinds of different modern conveniences helped to, uh, to bring the domestic sphere onto the hydro grid and to uh, really expand that grid substantially in, those, in that period. The primary iron, steel, automotive, and electrical apparatus industries grew in Southern Ontario as a result of cheap power and transportation, and also thanks to the Welland Canal and the proximity to the American manufacturing belts. Uh, this is a great picture of the Welland Vale Manufacturing Company uh, around sometime in the 1920s. It's a picture of um, only three of the men are actually labeled here, T. Shea, W. Hunt and Scotty Edmondstone, who are making, you can see they're making pitchfork uh, um, ends uh, in this picture. And to add to the uh, iron and steel industry, also many Ontario communities use tax bonus schemes to attract and keep industrial ventures and which provided quality employment opportunities for their citizens. From a social perspective also, the Great War had had some really important aspects of government involvement in everyday life. For example, few, fu food and fuel prices were controlled in 1916 and 17, and a wheat board operated between 1917 and 1920, which regulated the price of grain. Additionally, war bonds that were issued between the fall of 1915 and the fall of 1920 brought in $2 billion in revenue for Canada. And the financial control of this in Toronto versus uh, Montreal 
uh, signal the shift in the competitive positions of Montreal and Toronto as financial centers for the country. Uh, this is a really great war bond poster that came from the Canadian War Museum's collection, uh, and it's from 1918. Hmm. St. Catharines was an excellent subscriber to war bonds, as you'll, uh, you'll see shortly. In 1917, personal income tax was introduced, uh, plus taxes on the profits in trade and on gross revenues of insurance companies. Uh, these were designed to help finance the war effort, uh, but actually came too late in the war to have much of an impact. They were retained after the war, however, as an important source of revenue uh, to help reduce the heavy national debt as a result of the war. Reducing this debt as soon as possible would help Canada recover more quickly from the war and get on a successful post-war footing. The Military Hospital Commission, established in 1915 uh, to provide convalescent homes for soldiers who are already returning home as invalids from overseas uh, and, and to help to arrange their discharge once they came to Canada. In Canada, these were administered by municipalities uh, or as private hospitals that would provide on-call bed space. Uh, this picture is a picture of Oak Hill, which was located on Yates Street, it was the merit, it's the Merritt home uh, where say CKTB is currently located. Uh, this picture is from November 8th, 1917, uh, when it was being used as a military hospital. Military hospitals also provided for communities uh, the added support of serving non-combatants and supporting the communities within which they were established and helped to grow that particular social system uh, in those communities. Finally, as surplus time and money became available to an urban industrial society, the demand for rural or wilderness settings for day trips and vacations mounted. Railroads and steamboat facilities serviced grand hotels, private cottages and lakeside beaches, such as Lakeside Park. And as automobile ownership increased, uh, things like motels and campsites developed in more accessible places. But from the government perspective, the fear of private ownership of recreational lands created a demand within towns and cities for recreational and leisure space and the creation of public parks. Here too, there was competition from private and commercial interests that ran amusement parks or private clubs, but with the development of neighborhood parks and the use of school playgrounds, most neighborhoods by this period began to have open space for leisure use. Uh, this picture is from 1910. It's the Ennison Tea Dock uh, in Port de Luzi, and you can see the crowds uh, coming to the community uh, to spend their leisure time here. And I know this is before the war. It's a great picture, though. Uh, but uh, it, the, the growth of this did continue throughout the, uh, the post-war years. So this is the Canada of the post First World War era. And where did St. Catharines fit within this milieu um, is really the question that we're answering today. In 1921, St. Catharines had a population of uh, 19,800, roughly almost 19,900 and covered an area of 3.75 square miles. The city ranked 12th highest in population in Ontario and most and 28th most populous city in Canada. So we were actually a pretty big deal uh, in the post-war era. 85% of the population of our community at that time was of British descent, uh, which included 54% uh, English, 16% Irish, and 14% Scottish. The remaining 15% of the population, according to the census, was made up of French, Dutch, German, Italian, Hebrew, Polish, Black, Scandinavian, Russian, and Austrian. This is data that came from the census records, so I'm sure it's not, uh, it's not perfect. Of course, as you can see here, it doesn't actually include the percentage of Indigenous people who were living here at the time, which uh, no doubt there were some as well. Prior to the war, growth and development in the city was focused on the town center, uh, close to the current city hall and courthouse, uh, where our current city hall is today and the courthouse area, the, the, uh, where all the municipal, regional, provincial, and federal services were located. The post office, customs and inland revenues were located on the King and Queen Street areas, 
The military presence was located at the Lake Street Armory, just on the corner of Lake and Welland Avenue. And by 1912, just before the war, municipal administration had also added an engineer, a hospital board, a public library board, a board of health, board of school trustees, and water commissioners. So as you can see, military, sorry, municipal administration was growing significantly by this period. Uh, this picture for your interest is a picture of St. Paul Street looking east between Chestnut Street and Bond Street. It's taken in 1927 uh, and it's believed to be taken from the Lincoln Hotel balcony. Additionally, the community operated a farmer's market, a police services, fire services, including a paid fire chief, professional firefighters, and by 1917, its first motorized fire truck and a second fire hall, which was located at Lake Street and Albert Street, kind of behind the armories. The building is still there uh, in existence today, no longer as a fire hall. Uh, this picture is from July 1910 of the original fire hall located at St. Paul and Carlisle Street. Community also boasted wooden sidewalks, gas and electric street lamps, a cemetery, hospital, sanatorium, and numerous recreational amenities for the enjoyment of the community. St. Catharines was a growing concern and city council minutes to, can help to illustrate the burning issues of the community at the time. While all the council meetings contained interesting information for the researcher, the final council meeting of each year conveniently included a summary of the entire year. It actually took me quite a while to get through a whole year's worth of council minutes to find out that the end of the year meeting had a great summary. Uh, so that uh, made it a little quicker going from after, uh, after I made it through 1919. And just a reminder, uh, council is elected every year in this period. So January 1st is the election every year. And so the summary of uh, the council meeting in December is really to help to move the, the uh, council and the electric forward on what was going to happen potentially in the next term of council. Uh, this picture, although earlier than our period, I think is a great picture because it shows the wooden sidewalks um, along with the uh, the old Wall and Canal in the background and the downtown. This picture is actually the uh, was from 1885. I'm sure some of you have seen this photo before. It's a, it's actually a fairly common photo. So let's talk a little now. Let's find out about what was council dealing with. What are the burning issues at city council right after the First World War? Uh, I'm going to start with a very short look at 1918. Uh, sadly, the final council meeting of 1918 was missing from the box that I had. I fear that it might be in the 1917 box, which I wasn't able to take from City Hall. Uh, I only had so much room in my car. Um, and so uh, I will continue researching to see if I can find 1918, but I don't have a summary to share from that year. Unsurprisingly, the end of the war took up a major part of the business of November 1918. City of St. Catharines was a strong supporter of the victory loan campaigns and held a special meeting on November 15th of that year uh, to discuss the amount of money that the city would put into victory loans. The final motion on, of council on this reads, and here I'm going to quote, uh, therefore, the Council of the Corporation of the City of St. Catharines hereby resolves and authorizes, one, that the corporation subscribes to Canada's Victory Loan 1918 to the sum of $500,000, being the sum in the sinking funds available as mentioned, which you hear about earlier on in the report, and that the mayor and treasurer are hereby authorized to draw and sign the necessary application and checks therefore and two, that the city solicitor proceed with the necessary application to the legislature assembly at its next session for a special act validating such subscription in respect of sinking funds deposited with or held for deposit with the provincial treasurer, carried and signed by Mayor James Wiley. Uh, what this really means is that the city had already bought a substantial sum of money in uh, victory loan bonds, and wanted to take the money they had already put into the victory loan bonds with the Ontario legislature and add to it uh, from the sinking fund. This was kind of basically an investment uh, that would pay off uh, in the 1930s. Um, 
and was seen as a great investment by the cities, and they put a significant sum of uh, money uh, into purchasing uh, victory bonds uh, in 1918. So, of course, St. Catharines was a very patriotic community uh, and had uh, participated actively in the war effort both overseas and at home. Council at this meeting in November also made a motion to hold a service of Thanksgiving to celebrate the war's end. This is the motion here, or at least part of it. You can't see the bottom half of it. The language is very imperial. Uh, that uh, in order to properly observe the cessation of hostilities and the glorious victory of the British Empire, her allies and co-belligerents, a public service of Thanksgiving will be held on Sunday afternoon, December 1st next in Montebello Park, if weather permits or otherwise in the Grand Opera House. So of course the city was going to celebrate the end of the war. The business of, the, of running the city also needed to continue, and two other matters of importance were brought forward at this meeting. That the Power Commission be and are hereby requested to secure the necessary uh, authority from the power controller. Oh, I will put this picture up. Uh, necessary authority from the power controller at Ottawa, Ontario Hydro Commission to put in service all the street lights from the earliest possible date. Additionally, that the city clerk write to the same authority to ask that the order prohibiting the lighting of shop windows be rescinded at the earliest possible date. So war's over, it's been over for a few days. Let's write to the government and ask them if we can put our streetlights back again. During the war, they weren't allowed to have uh, the streetlights on um, just for national security reasons and also to preserve or to uh, uh, preserve fuel. Um, fuel reserves. This is a picture of, it's a little bit before, it's during the war, but it's a great picture uh, of the St. Catharines Public Utilities Line Gang from 1916. So they're the guys that go along and uh, install uh, public utilities such as lighting. It's an awesome picture. And the second burning issue and Perhaps more importantly, city council was very concerned about the Department of Railways and Canals getting the work on the Well and Ship Canal back up and running in anticipation of a large influx of returned soldiers looking for work and that this work of national importance be undertaken. The work had been discontinued since 1917 due to labor and material shortage, and now was a good time to get this work going to ensure that the returned men would have work to return to. The city was very aware of the burden that the community would be taking on with the higher rate of unemployed men. There were no social services for these people to fall back upon. And so it was really important that um, the city encourage the government to get as much public works, government public works, in addition to municipal public works, uh, going in order to suck up some of this, this extra labor force that was going to be in the community. So as you can see, in late 1918, the city council was ready to get back to business. By the end of 1919, city council had gotten on with business and dealt with their regular business throughout the year. A couple of interesting highlights that I came across uh, on the July 24th, 19 special meeting that was called, which is, this is a crazy special meeting. It was called specifically for this purpose. And it was to deal with the price of bread and cake. Uh, this picture is a little bit from just before the war. Uh, it's Wiley's Bakery in 1905. Awesome interior shot of a local business. Uh, showing all the lovely baked goods available. And here's the concern that was brought forward, that in view of the incre increase in the price of bread, rolls, and cakes recently made by the master bakers of the city and the complaints made by householders consequent thereon, this council is of the opinion that an investigation into the cost of such articles of food and the price at which same are held for sale or sold in this city be held and hereby authorizes and requests the Fair Price Inquiry Committee of St. Catharines 
to make a preliminary inquiry into the cost of bread rolls, cakes, and the like, and the price at which the same are held for sale or are being sold in this city. And on completion of such inquiry to report thereon to this council. So a fair price inquiry committee was struck to look at the concern of inflation in the price of bread and cake. Uh, city at council in this period really was very much the first line of defense for social services for residents. And it was really important for them to ensure that residents could afford to live on the wages that they were making. And part of that included keeping prices uh, reasonable uh, in the community. So additionally, in, 19, in addition to cake and, and bread, uh, in 1919, returned soldiers and those who didn't return continued to be a, an important issue that needed addressing by council. In December 1919, the Finance Committee reported on its careful study of the issue of taxation relief for returned men who owned homes. Uh, they were really brought forward to do this because of the Great War Veterans Association, who were a, a very powerful lobby group uh, after the war uh, to help to protect um, returned soldiers' interests, uh, which would eventually uh, become part of the, uh, the Royal Canadian Legion. And so the committee uh, looked at... Um, no, that's not it. The committee took a look at taxation. The Great War Veterans Association had specifically asked if the committee could take a look at taxation for um, returned men who owned homes and having taxation relief from the taxes on their home for up to 10 years. And so this is what they said. Your committee has given very careful consideration to the request of the Great War Veterans Association for exemption from taxation except for local improvements and school purposes for a period not exceeding 10 years. Dwelling houses assessed at not more than $3,000, owned and occupied by officers or men who have been active on overseas service. And while unanimous in their desire to give every possible assistance to returned men, it was found that as a considerable percentage of the returned soldiers were only tenants a reduction in taxation to those who owned or were purchasing property under agreement would be showing discrimination by benefiting only a part of the returned men. In view of this, the Finance Committee could not recommend the granting of this request until a more equitable solution on this matter could be found. Additionally, the Great War Veterans Association and some local um, uh, citizens who were uh, family members of soldiers who didn't return home um, really were asking city council to also take a look at the issue of a payment of an amount of money to dependents for soldiers of soldiers who were killed that were not insured by the city. Uh, you may or may not know that the city bought insurance policies for the first men that went overseas. Uh, and so this request came from those who were not insured, uh, who went later on uh, in the war. And this is what they say about the request. The request of the local Great War Veterans Association for payment of monies to dependents of soldiers who went overseas and were killed and were, who were not insured has also received the consideration of this committee. While the city council has never authorized any body or organization to assume that such monies would be paid, nor in any way promised such insurance, your committee feels that in as much as other men were insured by the corporation, it would only be just to assist those families which did not receive protection. But in this connection, your committee would point out, one, that insurance on men enlisting subsequent to the month of December, 1915, was not provident for the reason that the insurance companies for a considerable time refused to write further policies. Later, however, they issued policies, but at rates which were so high that it became prohibitive for the city to consider, continue this insurance. And two, that the first list of soldiers killed was received from the Great War Veterans Association in August of this year, and later in October, a corrected and additional list was received. The estimates having been already adopted and the tax rate struck, 
it is therefore impossible to re raise the amount required in the tax rate of 1919. Your committee therefore has not been in a position to raise the money this year, but it does approve of meeting this claim and would strongly recommend in the incoming council for 1920 that immediate attention be given to the matter so that the necessary sum may be raised. As to the manner of securing the money, next year's council can alone determine and decide whether the necessary sum can be included in the 1920 tax rate or be secured by the issue of debentures, providing sufficient borrowing power remains as fixed by statute. What to do? 1919 City Council passes it along to 1920 City Council, who actually don't make that decision. Supporting returned soldiers was an ongoing concern, and the local Great War Veterans Association continued to advocate throughout the interwar years, during the Second World War, of course, and after, uh, and continue to, uh, as the Canadian Legion continued to advocate for soldiers. But what of the state of city parks and cemeteries in the years after the war? The 1919 report, report on the parks and cemeteries Note that they find the state of the city's cemeteries and sports grounds in a deplorable state. At this point in time, the city had already purchased land near Niagara Street and Carlton, uh, roughly where Buchanan Hall is located today, uh, for future use as a cemetery, and that the use of this land for cemetery would be costly in dealing with future drainage required to make it usable. This uh, is a picture of the report itself and uh, basically talks about what did they do about this? All of a sudden the cemetery is full, the cemetery land that they purchased was not gonna work. And so they made quick and decisive action at the time and bought some land around Victoria Lawn Cemetery. This picture is post-war. Uh, quite a, it's actually post uh, during the Second World War, um, but of the new section of Victoria Lawn Cemetery. Uh, so I thought it would be a great picture to show here. Uh, so the city purchased uh, uh, land uh, across from Victoria Lawn Cemetery at the time and uh, um, bought about 20 acres of, um, sorry, bought 86 acres. So about 20 of the 86 acres uh, was considered of a very rich bank of sand and gravel, preeminently adopted for cemetery purposes, uh, which contained uh, what would have been a fortune to the speculators. And the committee says they were successful in obtaining the whole tract for just $17,400, which was an extremely low price. Uh, and should supply the cemetery needs for the city for 20 years to come and more. Uh, taking advantage of the acquisition direct and it indirect, the committee says it's safe to say that this deal is worth a sum of $50,000 to the city. So they've done a good, a good job here. And they say that the, the other property that was purchased was thus rendered obsolete for cemetery purposes and can be used for a model city farm for raising small fruits, et cetera, and should well pay its way. <clears throat> Eventually it will come in for a city industrial home and part of it likely for a park and playground for this section of the city. And so city council should have no regret uh, as to the original price of purchase. The Parks Committee also goes on to talk about the purchase of land for a new sports ground, which was going to be located in the vicinity of Thomas Street, Merritt Street, and Brock Avenue, uh, which was purchased from the Welland Vale Manufacturing Company. And it was expected that this purchase would be voted on by the electorate in 1920, along with the purchase of the cemetery lands. They also talked about the Rose Garden at Montebello Park, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, and noted that it was coming along well, and that in the next year, it should grow sufficient roses to supply the hospital and kindred institutions with abundance of cut roses. And the committee would like to see every sick room in the city that was wanting it also supplied from the city park. Which is really interesting. Um, now, I don't think we're encouraging anyone to cut flowers out of city parks to, uh, to take to your sick bed. Uh, but uh, uh, obviously in 1920, that was uh, the intention at the time. 
So of course we can't forget Public Works, which is usually, this is one of the pictures that drew me into this, this uh, topic. Um, one of the largest expenditures for city council in most years is the cost of maintaining the infrastructure within its purview, which includes roads, bridges, sewers, sidewalks, garbage, uh, and cleanup. Now, some of these things aren't part of city responsibility anymore. They're more of our upper tier municipalities, uh, but in the 19, the post-war period, 19 uh, teens and 20s and 30s, uh, garbage, uh, and public works, all of these public works were uh, included as city responsibility. In 1919, the city spent a total of $299,935 on pavement, sidewalks, and curbs and sewers. They also spent uh, $3,500 roughly on street watering and oiling, and about $2,300 on garbage collection, and, on, and about $4,500 on private drains. A lot of money spent on garbage collection uh, here in my mind. 1919 was actually a good year when it came to building permits issued and by extension, this was city growth. Uh, there were a lot of um, things that were talked about that helped to uh, develop the city. And part of that included uh, building more houses to be able to grow the population of the city. If there wasn't enough places for people to live, then people weren't going to come to our community. Building permits issued for 1919 are a record for the city of St. Catharines up to that time, with a number of dwelling houses at 175, which the committee says is creditable. The committee further report the following revenue that was received during the year. Amazingly, $1,223 was received in dog licenses. And then on top of that, $1,415 in general licenses for things like signage that you wanted to put up outside of your business, or uh, if you wanted to, uh, to take out a building permit to um, add a bathroom to your house or something like that. So a tidy sum received from these, uh, these two things. 1919 was a great year and bears out the predictions that St. Catharines was a growing community that needed to continue to maintain its infrastructure in order to attract additional businesses to locate in the city. There's numerous notes throughout many of the council minutes related to continued advertising, the benefits of businesses to relocating to the city and how the community would attract these businesses. The community was described in 1920 in a report of the Railway and Industrial Committee to Council. The industrial growth of the city and district during the year has been, has been considering the conditions that have existed very encouraging. Four new industries had located here. Those included the Walton Carlson Company on Queenston Street, Lincoln Basket Company on Niagara Street, the Ajax Wire, Wire Wheel Limited on Niagara Street, and the Sterling Electric Company on Balfour Street that manufactured storage batteries. While operations are being confined to a few lines at present, it is the intention of these concerns to gradually add other lines to their product, and there is every prospect that they will rapidly develop into industries of considerable magnitude. Very important. Uh, they also mention the Dominion Lamp Company have rebuilt their plant. The Monarch Knitting Company, which is uh, in this picture in the background of this picture from during the war which has the 98th Regimental Band in front of the Monarch Knitting Company. It's located on Page Street, that they've built a large addition to their plant. Whitman and Barnes Company have amalgamated with the J.H. William Company and purchased a new site on Lincoln Avenue. Uh, that ra railway right-of-ways were being built to some of these companies and that the T.F. Shirley Company have purchased the metal drying plant to establish themselves therein. So the Railway and Industrial Committee is really saying, you know what, we've done all this work to encourage all of these, these businesses to come to the community, and we want to uh, submit this as our report, uh, basically saying, yay, we're doing a great job. And that St. Catharines has enjoyed a very successful year industrially. The products of manufacturing plants are a variety for which there is a steady demand at all times. 
so that unless something unforeseen happens, there is no cause to worry about prosperity for some time to come. The city had created a town planning committee as well, who would spend the year working on strategies to bring businesses to the city, kind of like the Chamber of Commerce. So <laughs> in that interest, they carried out a survey of the local community that included who already was here, which included 114 companies listed as carrying out operations in St. Catharines, uh, as well as locations in the community where vacant industrial lands were just here waiting, ripe for the taking by any business who wants to come and start a business here. So this is 1919. By 1920, we start to see a little bit of a drop off in the building of dwelling houses with only 113 new houses being built, which was a drop of 62 from the year previous. Oh, that's my picture I want. So throughout the 1920s, fuel stores would consider, would continue to be a concern. Uh, and as shortages of coal and wood for heating homes would become acute. At different times during council meetings in that period, there's lots of talk about the fact that the cost of fuel is high or there's actually no fuel to be had by people living in the community. And so the city was really responsible for taking on this uh, uh, shortage and trying to, uh, to mitigate and do what they can to, uh, to support the community in this way. Um, the city continued to be responsible for many social services, like, as I mentioned earlier, um, money for homes for the aged of the community, a consumptive sanatorium, a children's shelter, shelter, and the St. Catharines General and Marine Hospital, which I did have a picture of earlier. Here it is. Uh, with funds expended on these at $20,000, uh, which also included $1,100 just for relief. Uh, lots of money is expended in every single council meeting towards relief of people in the community who can't support themselves. And then the park superintendent is also authorized to proceed with cutting down and removing some trees in Montebello Park. And that's what this is a picture of Ontario Street with Montebello Park on the right park on the right hand side. Uh, and these trees are necessary to be removed and that the wood from such trees be taken over by the city engineer to saw and split and sell for firewood. This action was made necessary because of the present supply of wood is all split and further work is necessary for the unemployed. So relief also included hiring people who were unemployed to do some of the work that the city required, infrastructure work, and, uh, as, and as you can see here, cutting wood for fuel. As the decade would go on, relief was a common line item in city financial statements, and the community supported those, uh, those in need. Bridge maintenance was also uh, an important part of public works. This is a picture of a soldier guarding the bridge during the First World War, uh, which is along the Third Welland Canal near Victoria Lawn Cemetery. And as an example, uh, in 1920, the government or the, the municipal government uh, have had correspondence for two or three years uh, with the Department of Railways and Canals regarding the maintenance of the bridges at Mill Street and Chestnut Street over the hydraulic raceway. And they were finally notified that the department would not undertake to rebuild or maintain these bridges. The Mill Street or Packard Bridge had been allowed to get in bad repair uh, pending this decision. And promptly after such decision had been received by council, the bridge was repaired with new stringers, trusses and floors and put in a good condition for several more years to come. The Chestnut Street Bridge floor is fast wearing out and a new concrete bridge floor on steel beams is being designed uh, to the sum of $1,300 placed in the estimates for its construction. There's also talk about the Burgoyne Bridge. The gutters on the Burgoyne Bridge were not built with the bridge to start with, owing to the delay in the settlement of the guarantee with the contractors. The five-year guarantee was expiring on December 31st, 1920, and the floor of the bridge required repair under this guarantee. 
The compromise was suggested that the contractor that instead of making the repairs to the wood block floor of the Burgoyne Ridge, he make a cash payment to the city to be used with an additional appropriation to build gutters on the bridge to overcome the defects in the drainage made by the bulging of the asphalt cushion under the wood block. This matter is in a fair way for early settlement and the construction of these gutters and repair to the floors may proceed in 1921. Additionally, the painting of the Glen Ridge Bridge and the Queenston Street Bridge was not done this year, owing to the scarcity of men who would do the work. But the steel work in these bridges is badly in need of paint protection and this work should be completed in 1922. So lots of work to be done on bridges, very expensive. And then of course, municipal government is kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place as they wait for decisions from other levels of government on whether they are responsible for these bridges or not. So they're estimated to be about 59 miles of streets in the city of which 23.4 miles are paved according to the works department. Uh, and this would be considered a satisfactory pr proportion if the remaining streets were capable of improvement without paving. But city council says, but with the great increase in motor traffic and the motorizing of delivery services of all kinds, the soil conditions found in our unpaved streets are not such as to provide passable roadways under all weather conditions without improvements. Then when improvement is made, the same motor traffic that awaits it, awaits it demands that it be made of a permanent enough character to withstand its traffic, hence the need for further pavement. So with that in mind, an asphalt plant available not only can be a savings in cost to the city, but a cheaper type of medium traffic pavement may be developed and permit the pavement mileage being extended to streets where such would not be considered of an, an extravagance. So the people of the city want their roads paved because they're starting to buy cars and they want all the roads paved, not just a few of them. Uh, you might have heard of stories where people were driving their cars along unpaved roads in the this time period and just completely stuck in the mud, the ruts, uh, not able to move uh, just because of the lack of paving. So City Works is recommending that they have their own paving plant to work from rather than having to have contractors. Additionally, oh, here's part of the paving equipment that the city uh, is using. This is the paving machine on Thorold Road uh, in 1919. Additionally, for the year 1920, uh, the city spent $17,186 uh, and approximately 20 miles of pavements were cleaned regularly as part of that, including the cleaning of catch basins. Here is our lovely machine from 1920 that cleaned the streets of St. Catharines. Street cleaning and garbage collection are said to be sanitary measures that are closely allied and have a large influence on the general health of a community. And this service has kept up as efficiently as has been possible having regard to employment conditions. This street sweeper was actually replaced in 1938 uh, by this street sweeper here. Uh, interestingly, the Standard ran an article that included the old street sweeper, which is really awesome that we're able to have this picture um, because uh, uh, they were able to uh, to find the old street sweeper when they uh, were replacing the uh, the new one. Garbage collection comes up all the time in city council minutes. It's a huge issue in St. Catharines, what to do with all the garbage, what to do with this, the garbage in the streets. Uh, and the city says, the works committee says that in this service, there have been employed five teams of 12 men and a foreman at a total cost to the year of $25,941 which is 2.2 mils on the dollar if you're a person who's interested in the mill rate in 1920. Um, and it ran a bit of a deficit because there was so much garbage to pick up, they didn't expect it to cost as much as what it actually did cost. 
In addition to street cleaning and garbage cleanup, the city was also responsible for oiling and watering the streets that were unpaved. And there were 18 streets that were oiled during that year uh, to a cost of just under $3,000. One thing I hadn't mentioned so far uh, that comes up in this particular slide uh, is that the city always continued to be responsible for fire and police services. Uh, they reported at every single council meeting all of their budget. Uh, so if you're really interested in how much it costs for everything related to fire or police, uh, all of that information is in the council meeting uh, minutes. As noted here in 1921, during the year, the department responded to 65 alarms of fire, 21 box alarms. So those red phone boxes on the uh, the alarm poles or on the, the um, telephone poles down in the, uh, the downtown area, 42 phone alarms and two still alarms. And the department had in use at fires, 5,900 feet of hose, 225 feet of ladders, and used 121 gallons of chemical and handled during practice hours, 700 feet of ladders and 3000 feet of hose. And the fire department was on duty 24 hours and 40 minutes and did a practice drills of 408 hours. The report also goes on to state that the department consisted of 23 men, chief and assistant chief working on a two platoon system. Their equipment in 1921 included one American LaFrance combination chemical and hose motor car and one Rio combination chemical and hose motor car, one horse drawn hook and ladder wagon, one spare hose wagon, one spare hose reel, one steam fire engine, one horse and, and the chief's Oh, sorry, I made some sort of spelling mistake in my notes, so I don't even know what this means. And one supply wagon, all in a state of a fair state of repair. This is a great picture of the Meriton Fire Department. I know it's not St. Catharines at this time of, uh, of in this period, but it's a great picture of the American or the Meriton Fire Department in 1918 with their motorized fire truck. And here we are in the front of the St. Catharines Fire Station uh, in 1925, again with a fire truck. This is a ladder truck uh, that's located here. The committee did suggest uh, after talking about all these things um, that it, they might say that the time is near at hand when the council should be obliged to exchange the horses on the ladder truck. Uh, and then I think it would be in the best interest to look into motorizing the ladder truck or it might even be look into the matter of a new fire hall and a truck might be brought in that would be suitable for this city for 30 years to come as a 65 or 70 foot ladder could then pre be procured for which we have not the room at present. So as you can see here, by 1925, they've purchased a ladder, a motorized ladder truck. Uh, there's actually, it was uh, another picture I came across, which I didn't use in this presentation of them testing the new ladders uh, on the armory building right at the kind of the peak above the doorway in the armory. Notes from council in that year also included some information from labor organizations who continued to lobby to have the well and ship canal construction carry on throughout the winter months. Uh, as you probably can imagine the construction was slowing down during the winter months because it was quite cold and the work was tedious. Uh, but the Trades and Labor Council, and here's their letter to council, um, was really there to advocate for the labor uh, that was working in, in the city. And they said, owing to the fact that the present contractors on sections one and two of the Welland Ship Canal have temporarily closed for the winter, and that work on the said sections during the winter of 1920 and 21 was continued throughout with no loss of time and to good purpose, that the cessation of operation has been a great hardship to many who worked there in former seasons when the work was continued throughout the winter with no interruption, employing hundreds of men. It is resolved by the St. Catharines Trades and Labor Council that steps should at once be taken to bring the matter to the attention of the incoming administration requesting that pressure be bought to bear upon the present contractors, and they name them Porter Brothers, to change their present plans and resume operations within a reasonable time, or 
that the contract be canceled and re-let to a more progressive firm without delay, or that the government take it over and operate as formerly on any basis that is deemed advisable to ensure work to the large and increasingly number of unemployed in nearby towns and cities. The last thing I wanted to mention about this particular, uh, this is a great letter, by the way, and uh, really interesting information throughout the council minutes about how the well and canal construction is impacting the community. Can't go into all of it because there's so much of it, but uh, um, some really great stuff. But the last thing I wanted to mention about uh, 1921 goes back to garbage collection, which I found really amusing most of the time. Garbage collection, they say, in 1921 has been conducted with a fewer number of complaints than any other year since its inauguration, and the whole cost of garbage service was included in the general rate in 1921. So prior to that, uh, the cost of garbage service was uh, taken up uh, somewhat by uh, uh, businesses along the way. So the committee also uh, notes that they have made repeated efforts to improve mail and passenger train service uh, rendered by the Grand Trunk Railway System. Uh, and the committee has the assurance of the district passenger agent that the Grand Trunk Railway will do everything possible to improve the service. Very important if you're living in a community that is very successful, that your mail and passenger service by train is very reliable. The service apparently to a large extent is governed by connections at Suspension Bridge crossing the Niagara River, but the committee was endeavoring to have morning trains better spaced and to make arrangements with the joint committee of the district uh, for a meeting with the president of the Grand Trunk Railway System early in the new year. But with the help of the Chamber of Commerce, the city's planning committee was jointly instrumental in procuring for the district a motor bus line to Beamsville. Yay, this is a great picture from uh, 19, time in the 1920s of the Wary bus line. Uh, and the committee was jointly, uh, sorry, but they were instrumental in getting the motor bus line to Beamsville. This was a new departure which resulted in mutual benefit to the city and district. And they wish to congratulate Mr. Malloy, the owner of this business, uh, for his energy and enterprise. How did this impact what was already existing? There was a fraught relationship between municipal government and the NSNT street railway system, and the competition uh, with motor bus lines would eventually, I think, serve the death knell of uh, the NSNT. Uh, if you're interested in hearing more about the NSNT, Adrian did a presentation on the NSNT that you can find on our YouTube channel uh, that talks uh, more about how the the impact of competition uh, happened. But I can say that throughout the NSNT was. Uh, throughout the, the time period that we're talking about, the NST was regularly in uh, communication with city council who try to improve their infrastructure at a reasonable cost to themselves and to keep rates low. Council wanted them to keep their fares low, uh, but of course they wanted to raise their fares to be able to improve their infrastructure or fix their infrastructure. And city council says about the street railway system, Referring to the local street railway system, your committee have for the past three years made repeated efforts with the Niagara St. Catharines and Toronto Railway officials for improved service, but have always been advised that not much in the way of improved service conditions could be expected until the company was provided with funds for more equipment and et cetera. And this was prevented by the option to the Ontario government. The ratepayers will on January the 2nd have the privilege of choosing for him, themselves the settlement of this important program. So it was really up to the government to decide. Clearly, the Ontario government had somehow added uh, um, some regulation related to uh, public transit in the province. I wanted to make mention of, of at this point, about relief uh, and the relief in 1921. There was a relief committee and city council put $2,400 in the budget uh, towards relief um, and more money was uh, than anticipated had to be spent in relief owing to the ac acute conditions of distress. 
uh, which they say have arisen from prevailing conditions. The total expenditure on relief in 1921 actually reached $6,461. So it went up by uh, $4,000 more than was expected um, just because of the, the particular environment or economic conditions that were happening at the same time. At the commencement of the, the year of 1921, the, the Relief Committee had to undertake on the shortest notice and under extreme difficult conditions, the relief of every grave condition which existed during the severest part of the winter owing to a shortage of coal and was unable to a large extent to alleviate matters and avoid considerable suffering and hardship. 198 families were given relief at that time. Numerous meal tickets were issued and with other charitable cases, the committee issued altogether 1,035 orders. So in the council budgets, every single week, uh, council meeting, there's a whole bunch of different items that are noted as relief. And that's what these were going towards. Money for food, money for housing, uh, sometimes employment as well. The committee, the relief committee felt that during that year, they had been of considerable help to the citizens in assisting in relieving distressed conditions uh, and really appreciated the work of the Great War Veterans Association uh, in uh, providing space in their building in which cots were provided for the unemployed who had no sleeping quarters. So you can imagine what was happening in the community at the time that uh, they had to use basically the Legion uh, at the time uh, to provide additional sleeping quarters for those who uh, required relief. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to 1929. I'll move us forward from here uh, and uh, we'll talk about uh, a little bit about 1929. Uh, this picture is actually from a little bit later, 1936, uh, but it's a great picture of a whole bunch of men moving snow around. Uh, and in December 1929, the report for council talked about a series of large snowfall that had cost the city more money than expected. And because of that tax, the amount of the budget was overspent. Uh, they had upwards of 100 men and 10 trucks employed in shifts over the course of two weeks to move the snow off city streets at a cost of approximately $500 per day. But on the bright side, the early arrival of snow made less of a need for street cleaning. And so the cost for that service was reduced throughout the year. In addition to that, in 1929, 6,000 linear feet of sidewalk was built, which cost $6,500 throughout the year. The city bought a keystone excavator. Here's a picture of what it looks like uh, from an ad. Uh, we don't actually have a picture of the city's actual excavator, but the cost of it was just under $8,000. And uh, for 1929, they used it on raceway work and primarily on pavement construction and sewer work. Uh, sewer improvements were made on Carlton Street. Now this picture is actually earlier than 1929, uh, but it is actually a picture of block sewer being installed on Carlton Street, uh, which is, uh, is great. And additionally, a new brick shop was built at the City Yard, which was located on North Street. Apparently it was located roughly across from where the Gales Gas uh, Station is located on Welland Avenue, uh, over close to the Giant Tiger. Um, in that part of the city. An Ingersoll Rand air compressor was purchased by the city in 1929. And throughout the winter months, to try to make in some revenue to pay for this thing, it was rented out and brought revenue into the city. <laughs> and city council was being asked to spend some more money on equipment uh, to supplement its construction and paving plant with one additional dump truck in 1930. Additionally, 6,000, as far as infrastructure improvements go, 6,000 lineal feet of new sewers were constructed on 12 streets to the cost of $10,000. Lots of infrastructure in 1929. In 1930, a large program of construction works was carried out throughout 1930, and Part of this was in, in response of a need to provide work for unemployed men. Uh, and you can see here, this is actually the list of, sorry that it's off and kind of wonky. Uh, it was a difficult um, 
page to get a scan of because it was in that large bound book of council minutes. Um, and so these are the streets and the projects that were taken part by people who were unemployed. And this was relief work, so make work projects. So garbage disposal tank was built, new uh, running track was built at the Central Park. Uh, there was raceway improvements, tree stumps were removed, pavement improvements, grading, surfacing, and street widening, all part of um, construction that was undertaken as a means of relieving the unemployment situation. And during 1930, approximately 300 men were working daily uh, in order for, uh, through the unemployment uh, situation. There was a special unemployment committee that was actually struck in 1930 to deal with this depression that was happening all across the country uh, and what the city of St. Catharines uh, was doing for that. And the committee's report says, upon, upon the opening of the relief works, it was soon apparent that the approved $150,000 works program to which the government contributed half, $75,000, would not provide for all the applicants. And upon renewed application to the government, a further $25,000 was received by the community. And the final program totaled $200,000. This amount provided work for approximately 500 men working alternate weeks under the following arrangement. Among the men with families were a number with greater responsibilities and in consequence, the system of distribution considered most equitable. So first, the married men having children were given first prefer preference. Uh, 48 applicants uh, had four or more children under 16 years of age, and these were placed in steady employment. The remaining married applicants with children had worked alternate weeks. Married applicants having no children had received alternate weeks. And single applicants having dependent parents also received alternate weeks. About 30 single ex-service applicants have as the work has been afforded, been assigned employment every third week. These are men of mature age as compared with the remaining single applicants without dependents, 80% of whom are youth for the most part re residing at home. It goes further on to say, it cannot as yet be said that the peak has been reached. Men with wives and children and others having dependents are in the judgment of this committee the first care for employment, and these may have been assigned, may have to be assigned to the affairs at present under advisement, but this must be decided in view of future events. So relief became a major issue uh, in 1930. And uh, sorry, this is basically just what I just read you. Um, and so, um, it was a, actually a major portion of the last uh, kind of a summary of city council from that uh, particular year. And I would imagine if I were to go uh, and continue researching into the 1930s, that this would be a common theme uh, going forward. And uh, I may, uh, if I have time, go and take a look at that, uh, because I think it would be really interesting to hear more of how much uh, the municipality was required to, uh, to take on uh, from relief work during the Depression. So no final decision on movement was made by the end of 1930, but it was really recommended that council continue to look at the issue and provide recommendations for the next term of, uh, of city council on how to deal with uh, this uh, huge added expense that was uh, being taken on by the tax base. So I think that's the end of, of what I'll tell you about the council highlights that I found. Uh, I did find it actually quite interesting. I hope you found this interesting as well. Uh, but I do have one last little glimpse of sometimes the weird and odd things that come up uh, at city council. And this is a letter from a woman named Lily Mead, uh, who wrote to council in November 25th, 1918. And I'm going to read it because it's hard to see. Gentlemen, I, for one, think that the businessmen of this city could give their lady clerks and bookkeepers shorter hours for work. They would not lose anything by closing their stores at five o'clock in the evening. And how much nicer would it be for the girls? We have a lot of pale looking girls in this city. Our boys that went away were the picked bunch of the city. Now some are coming back, some gassed, some with worse. 
take this all in consideration and see what the coming generation is going to be if our young ladies are going to be kept killed with work. And then in caps, what will our coming generation be? Now, I wish you would take this in consideration and see if working girls could not get the hours that the girls of Toronto and other cities have from nine in the morning until five o'clock at night. Trusting you will take this up, I remain yours truly, Lily Mead. This was just filed and accepted <laughs> uh, for file. Nothing was taken up by city council to change the uh, the hours of work for the pale girls of our city. Uh, but I thought it was uh, very interesting uh, that uh, that someone would consider that we needed to uh, to have less hours as women. So anyway, this lecture was really just a tasting menu of what I thought were interesting happenings with regards to public works in St. Catharines uh, in the interwar years. Uh, the huge volume of information that's available to study regarding city operations is it's enormous. Uh, and it could actually be, you know, a whole year's worth of presentations, maybe not super riveting, but there you go. Uh, but I really appreciate everyone who continued to stay with me along for this uh, last hour or so ride uh, through Public Works in St. Catharines. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Uh... Okay, uh, thank you so much, Kathleen, for a very well-researched presentation. That was incredible. I, um, I'm a little fearful of, you know, uh, maybe all of our emails and documents being up for grabs for historians in a hundred years. <laughs> uh, if you have any questions or comments, please post them in the chat box now. There's already a few there, so we'll, we'll get to those in a second. Thank you so much. <laughs> While we wait for any further questions or comments, if you enjoyed to, uh, oh, yep, there's the chat box. If you enjoyed tonight's presentation, please consider making a donation to the museum so we can continue to deliver the high quality programming you expect from us. We really appreciate any donation that you're able to make. Give us a call at 905-984-8880 or visit the donation portal on our active STC page to make a donation. The link for the portal was also included in today's VMLS email. Your donation makes a difference. Thank you. We'd also like to remind everyone, please, to like, follow, and subscribe on all of our social media channels, including here on YouTube, uh, WordPress. Um, uh, our programmer, Abby, has a great blog series on right now in November about uh, some awesome stories from uh, the both world wars. Uh, so do catch up on that on WordPress and our podcasts, uh, wherever you get your podcasts, of course. If you enjoy our content, please share in your networks to help more of our community join in the historical adventures. Coming up next on the Virtual Museum Lecture Series uh, on November 29th, I'm going to try it again. <laughs> uh, Ponderous Fraus, Miners and Jaded Farm Horses, or Early St. Catharines Before the First Welland Canal. And, oops, what did I do? did something okay there we go um it's really uh, uh and what a great uh pairing this lecture and that lecture uh basically 100 years ago and 200 years ago it'll be really fun uh really interesting uh the virtual museum lecture series produced by the st catherine's museum and well canal center and the city of st catherine's awesome so uh, a couple questions there for you kathy um and a couple observations too i'm gonna go first uh, but there are some uh, some comments and questions. So uh, first, I just want to say uh, NSNT lecture was our actually very first lecture, everybody. So <laughs> even if you don't care about the NSNT, <laughs> if you're new to the lecture series, you have to go back and start at the beginning. And that's the first one is the NSNT. So check it out. Uh, super cool. And actually that lecture starts, or sorry, finishes just around the time that Kathy's lecture started tonight. So uh, that it's a really interesting story. Definitely check it out. I wanted to say it's really cool to see the foundations of our city today. Um, there's not a lot left of the city from the 1850s or even up to the 1880s and 90s, but there's still lots, especially in terms of like the uninteresting infrastructure, like roads. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and stuff. Uh, this is the time period when a lot was being paid for the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, so some of those pictures are still the same, which is really cool. So it's very interesting to see the foundations of our city. Usually when we talk about history, it's like 150 years ago, 200 years ago, when we talk, we'll talk to Brian next week about 200 years ago and even earlier, there's not much left to see of that, but this is really cool to actually see recognizable images uh, from a hundred years ago. So that's good. History is all around us. Um, the budget must've been really fun. Talk about the budget process. <laughs> Was there any hints about, you know, our budget process is really involved. Um, there's, you know, committees and all this stuff and uh, it's an annual budget, but there's, it's a four-year council. So how did, what was budget process like with a one-year council? Uh, they don't really go into what that budget process looked like behind the scenes. Uh, basically, it's just the budget document that's there at the end of the year, um, essentially. Um, it's really not even a budget document. It's just a financial statement. Right. Uh, but they've kind of provided like the estimates for the next next term, essentially. And then every month there's a financial statement that, I mean, you could go through there and really take like delve, like if you're really into that kind of thing, like really delve into the financial history of different things, uh, how much people were being paid, how much was it costing to take out stumps, the cost of line- a linear feet of, paving and all kinds of different things um but uh it's so much information it's almost was too much like i almost had i had such a hard time with this presentation because it was like i had too much information in the end i'd read too much and i was like i don't even know where to focus on to to be able to tell this story and what is it so you know trying to just find the things that i thought were interesting which may not even be what our audience is finding interesting but uh um you can go almost anywhere with with where like I didn't even talk about half of the stuff that city I didn't talk about police at all that of where city council right. was going so right yeah absolutely uh, speaking of Brian shout out to Brian Brian says interesting Brian. presentation and great photos especially the one showing the original street sweeper oh yes that's such a great picture and you know we're so lucky to have that picture because. We actually don't have any pictures from the 1920s St. Catherine Standard. We only have pictures starting in the 1930s. And it just so happens that for some reason, the city still had the street sweeper in the 1930s when they replaced it uh, with this new one. And they they put a picture in the paper in 1938, which was so we had the 1921 street sweeper. But I just think it's the greatest one of the best pictures, actually. I love the um, the oiling of streets too, which gives you a sense that there are still dirt roads uh, oh, yeah. inside the urban limits that the city was responsible for. So there were actually like, uh, they're not just unimproved roads that are like you're on your own. They're yeah. like mostly dirt streets all around the city, right? Yeah. Exactly, and there was actually a couple of letters to council in some of the council meetings. A lot of them had the correspondence that went with some of these decisions. Uh, and uh, there were some letters to council from ratepayers in certain areas. So there was like the ratepayers in the Queenston Street area. Yeah. And it was like a long petition. So everybody's name was signed at the bottom to please oil our roads. <laughs> please, God, please, come. please come and oil our roads. Come and put some water on the road and oil the roads yeah. because we can't yeah. take the amount of, uh, of uh, dust that's being shot up onto our clothes yeah. that are sitting on the yeah. line or something. They didn't actually say that, but that's what yeah. I'm assuming yeah. is <laughs> part of the uh, problem. Yeah, I grew up on a gravel road and the dust was pretty bad sometimes, but we're like in the we're in the country, so we're far away from the road. It's not really a big deal. But if you're in an urban area, lots of houses together, and then like, you know, our maybe one car went down the road a day and <laughs> on our road. Um, if there's cars and streetcars and horses and all sorts of things going down the road all the time, man, that would be so dirty. So, so, so dirty. Yeah. There's so many letters and interesting articles about how dirty everything was. So, <laughs> yeah, well, <it's- laughs> I didn't even talk about a whole yeah. thing that was happening in the late 1920s about smoke in the city, the emissions from smoke oh, yeah, in totally. the city apparently was a huge deal. And they yeah. actually had a special committee that they struck to deal with the issue right. of emissions uh, throughout the community. I didn't even go into that. Which I'm, was to- really I'm totally getting like uh, um, Charles Dickens vibes. What's yes. That? Uh, Great Expectations or the, what's the other one? The um, nowhere it's really dirty where they're living. Is that Great Expectation? Uh, yeah. Could be. Anyway, super dirty. Uh, Victorian, super dirty, Victorian <laughs> urban spaces. Yeah, great. Another lecture probably on uh, dirty Victorian spaces, because we were one for sure. 
<laughs> uh, Des says, wary bus station picture with background. Uh, the gas is for 18 cents a gallon, question mark. Sounds good to me. I agree, <laughs> Des. That'd be great. Yeah. One of the other things that was really interesting is the city council regulated who was able to put in a gas tank to be able to have their own gas on their property. Oh, and cool. so many businesses in this period, not surprisingly, because of the growth in automobile, so many businesses are asking city council to be able to put in a giant tank on their property to be able to pump gas, uh, either for their own business, like so the, the tractors and the trucks that they had as part of their own business or as part of a business that supports in automobile traffic in the city. That's so interesting from like the first vehicles in the city, like 1905-ish, right? To 15 years later, everybody, like imagine if you're getting your own gas tank, then you have enough vehicles to, you know, do that. So like just the the population of vehicles just exploding yeah. seemingly overnight. Like imagine being born in the 1860s and then like within 10 years, there's cars everywhere. Like that's crazy. Yeah. Um, I know that's that's well documented, so but I shouldn't be shocked. Uh, Brian says my grandparents received relief money for milk for their daughter, awesome. his mother, and my grand uh, his grandmother was given assistance for a goiter operation in the early 30s. <laughs> so I don't mean to laugh at it. <laughs> Medical history is weird. Uh to me anyway. Uh and then Brian also says interesting to see that some concrete paved streets still exist. Yep. Facer Street, Grantham Avenue. Uh, seems to be more durable paving than as- asphalt, uh, proving my point about how there's lots of the city still around if you yeah. look, know where to look and know what you're looking at. Um, so there was yeah. lots of cool stuff about different neighborhoods. Face of Street asked many, many times from city council if they could have more street lights. Uh, it came up lights. a bunch of times. Uh, you want to say why? Because I know the neighborhood why. wanted more street lights uh, because they basically they're saying our neighborhood is sketchy and you need to give us more street lights uh, so that it it feels safer to be in our neighborhood. Yeah. Um, not that it was actually sketchy, but it felt sketchy because it was dark all the time. But yeah. uh, lots of requests by city council and lots of parts of the the fire department and the lighting department were part of the same committee. Totally. Uh, lots of uh, reports of the lighting committee that talks about the addition of streetlights in different areas, the addition of lights in rural, in more rural areas of the city. So lights being put up at like, you know, those intersections now that you drive along and all of a sudden a street is like coming out and there's a light right there. Yeah. It's like those kind of floodlights being built in some of the, uh, the more rural parts of the community. So you yeah. can see that it's really starting to kind of grow outwards, which is cool. The light committee. Da, 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 da. <laughs> they need, yeah, they definitely got a theme song. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Have a lovely, thank you very much thank Kathleen, you, everyone. for all of your re- research. I have to say Kathleen's been like, just nose to the grindstone. Well, nose to those council minutes <laughs> really for months and months and months and like looking for pictures and all that stuff. So um, huge, huge props to Kathleen for an incredible amount of research. I'm hoping to convince her to turn it into a blog series as well. <laughs> So keep your eyes open for that in the future. Thanks so much, Kathleen. And thank you everybody for joining us. We'll see you in two weeks for Brian's lecture. Have a good night.